Professor of Chinese Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you so much, um, Ivan and Sarah, for inviting me here. I feel very lucky, lucky to be here. Um, so my paper is on the material culture of China's cultural revolution. And the objects in my paper fall into two categories. So things from old society, and really what's called old society, China's pre-1949 past, and things from new society, or what was known as New China, which is also New China with capital N, capital C. The slogan is, without the Communist Ch Party, there would be no New China. Uh, and when I was um, an English teacher in China um, uh, over about 15 years ago, when China joined the WTO, I happened to be in a bar where everybody was in the bar, without the Communist Party, there would be no new China to celebrate the um, joining of the WTO. <laughs> so we have old China and new China. Today, new China is referred to by historians as Mao, the Mao era or China's socialist past. I'm interested in the fate of both um, of old and new things, although what's old and what's new, of course, changes over time. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in the Cultural Revolution 1966, when it broke out to 1976, when Mao died. Um, and also their old, their post-socialist afterlives. So there are multiple parts to this paper. To answer John Robb's question, um, materials in and of new Ch Mao's China did have temporality, a temporality <coughs> imposed by the revolutionary state, old China and new China. But what I hope to show today is that even under authoritarian rule, such boundaries were blurred. First, some of my own definitions and examples. So our group is material culture and the symbolic. And here, I hope to show that the case of communist China gives us a way to look at how, um, what objects meant in the world's most populous country a short generation ago. There were objects that symbolized the old society, or China's feudal and semi-colonial past, um, which came under attack at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution as what you might have heard of. Heard of um, it was called the attack on the four olds. Um, old, the four olds were old ideology, old culture, old customs, and old habits. So fitting into the previous category of obsolete or discarded things, there were actually these categories, but what each of those olds was was subject to interpretation. So in these images, you see illustrated the attack on the four olds movement, which um, broke out in the summer of 1966. And the people depicted our Red Guards, young Chinese called upon to become revolutionary by making revolution. They had, after all, not participated in um, in the liberation of China. So here they had to um, become revolutionary through their own experience. So the attack on the four olds was carried out publicly as red guards desecrated temples, as you see on the right, or mobbed individuals on the street who had um, the appearances of, of wanting to be bourgeois. So permed hair, for example, was shaved off. Um, a certain kind of bell-bottom pants were uh, cut off. Uh, pointed shoes were also taken away. Um, and you see that in that image, right? And most of the things, speaking of iconoclasm, on the left are, um, are, are religious or um, uh, I guess classical things, like um, a book of the classics um, uh, that indicate morality on the very far right, um, a Buddha, a crucifix you see also there. You also see a record, um, and you see dice, right, for gambling underneath. Um, so this took place publicly, and it took place privately when Red Guards invaded homes as part of the house search. This was called chao jia, or to search and confiscate the home. Confiscating possessions that reflected capitalist lifestyles, or worse, were evidence of counter-revolutionary aims. So here, material culture really is evidence. Um, so the objects that symbolized the old society were excrescences on the new revolutionary society. With new China uh, came what Daniel Smale referred to as a change in the material regime and uh, a new system of signs. But at Cultural Revolution's height, an incriminating object was potentially fatal. It could mean being beaten to death. It could mean a bad political label. Um, it could mean familial ruin. Opposed to, the objects, uh, opposed to the objects of old society are the things of new society, sacred for being revolutionary. The most everyday objects were covered with revolutionary slogans and images, from tin wash basins to towels. In an era of scarcity, these things were cherished, and the most sacred among them were treated with reverence, the Chairman Mao portrait in the home to which one reported morning and night, the silk scarf of the young pioneer, the little red scarf around the neck, um, and the mangoes bestowed by Mao enshrined as relics. Uh, so speaking of relics, today these <laughs> symbols of New China are preserved as Mao kitsch, or quote unquote red collection, and are the subject of much scholarship in history, anthropology, and art history. Um, so what you see on the right is uh, part of 
uh, a propaganda poster where um, these uh, Ma these mangoes, and so some of you probably had some mango this morning, had a slice of mango. Um, uh, so these mangoes were given to Mao as a foreign dig by a group of visiting foreign dignitaries. And Mao then, um, this is uh, the second year of the Cultural Revolution, bestowed the, uh, these golden mangoes um, on a factory. Um, and uh, then the mangoes became a symbol. So you can see mangoes on, on many things from the Cultural Revolution. They were replicated here in wax. Those original mangoes that were given out were then gifted elsewhere. Um, they were uh, peeled and boiled into a broth that people then drank spoonfuls of. Um, so thinking of the mango you might have had this morning, you could imagine that um, a Chinese person of my parents' generation might also taste that mango and think of something very, very different. Um, uh, you can now buy that mango, that wax mango, on eBay, the Chinese version of eBay, if you like. So uh, in the time I have today, I'd like to briefly summarize my paper and draw some links between the, my paper and other papers. In the first section, I, I survey the literature on material culture in China. My focus here is to use the entirety of the Mao period to examine how material culture became a proxy for class before the Cultural Revolution, priming the pump for the attack on the Four Olds. I think it's important to make a few background points. Um, first, unlike Christopher Lovelace's case of old or past things as a source of legitimacy, the new communist state rejected the old, and there are some exceptions to this. Um, and they did this ritualistically, as in the division, the public division of the landlord's possessions. Um, this image <coughs> depicts a children's book called The Despicable Landlord um, from 1964 in which the objects of the exploiting class are juxtaposed with the objects of the working class. So, you know, a luxurious quilt, um, a, uh, a dragon bed that actually was part of an exhibition that I can tell you about more later. Um, and on the right, of course, those are the, um, a pair of pants that were worn for three generations by a peasant who is freezing in the cold. Um, so from a very early age, children were taught to see things um, as having a, a very strong class valence. Um, Second, this was an economy in which consumer goods were few and material were rationed. Poverty was a revolutionary virtue, and past personal and familial wealth was to be hidden or shunned. Third, despite the division between old and new, new China also had its social categories with their attendant and materially different lives. So yes, people still did have a sense of different social class, a soldier, a, a cadre, a peasant, a worker. Um, and then reflecting on how Stephen Kahn's framing of, of uh, how objects convey knowledge, oral histories are used in this section of my paper to demonstrate how objects symbolize class. So how did children actually growing up in this, this period um, understand what was proletarian, what was capitalist? In the second section, I, I focus on the attack on the four olds and the house search. Um, so this uh, searching of people's houses uh, to discover who was counter-revolutionary. Thinking about the role of materials in performance, as Olaya Sanfuente suggests, I argue that the discovery of the incriminating four olds was ritualized. Two points are essential here. First, the Red Guards were encouraged to and actually put on displays of the evidence that they collected. Um, some of these were perfunctory, such as putting tables out outside of people's houses to show the contents of what was found, or the dangling of a teacher's leather shoes by the school gate. Um, some were far more elaborate. Um, uh, such as an exhibit uh, that accompanied a show trial, for example, or a curate exhibition that was seen by thousands. Uh, many of our papers reflect on museums and collecting, like Catherine Whalen's Americana Collectors. Here, an iconoclastic movement became a form of collection and exhibition. Um, and here you see uh, a fur coat being put on display. And what's interesting here is that these books, uh, these ex this exhibition was doing what those kids' books uh, were doing. That is saying that this coat cost this much, it was owned by this counter-revolutionary capitalist, this is how much it cost, and this is how many peasants you could feed in a year um, on, with the value of this coat. Um, second, crucial to the Red Guard's curatorial argument was that counter-revolutionary objects were hidden. So while stacks of gold bars dazzled the ordinary observer, it was important to explain that they had been hidden, or they had been hoarded for capitalist restoration or concealed from the, revolution, or from the searching eyes of the revolutionary masses. So like Daniel Smale's reading of the 1334 coverlet in a haystack, the Red Guards also read concealment for the motivation of the owner. A hidden weapon meant loyalty to other regimes and validation that the Cultural Revolution was right, that see, we were right, there were counter-revolutionaries. 
Um, in the third section, I examine the fate of the four old objects after the initial Red Guard attack. So what happened to all of this stuff that people collected? Archival material limited and also off limits and cultural revolution ephemera show that the allegedly anachronistic objects of the old society did have a place in the new. A complex system with intended bureaucrats, like hundreds of bureaucrats, sprang up to inventory and process these objects, which had one of several fates. Outright confiscation, which led to repurposing and resale. Um, suspension, as in the political fate uh, when the, the status of the owners was not clear, what, were they counter-revolutionary or not, then their, uh, their objects then sat in a holding pattern. Um, or return, which happened during, both during the Cultural Revolution and after, and loss. Um, and so maybe what I'll just do is show you the last uh, couple of slides. Um, this third part of my paper looks at these inventories. You have an example of things that are taken from someone's house on the left, so you would get a receipt, or some people got receipts. Um, on the bottom is um, particularly the museum. Um, if the museum was coming to get your stuff, then you would get a, a separate kind of inventory. And then on the far right is a price list. Um, so they were, you could actually buy Rolex if you wanted to during this period for what is in the equivalent of about 30 US dollars today. Um, and then the fourth and final section, I look at the post socialist afterlives of these cultural revolution objects. Um, and so then speaking of the, uh, um, the, the the collection and uh, what to do with all of these newspapers. I look at the collection and exhibition of cultural revolution objects. There on the upper left, you see uh, cultural revolution mirrors on the right, armbands. Um, and the, the greater point I want to make here is that um, it is quite easy to collect, and you see this across um, the 76 divide, um, but it is much more difficult to, to decipher their meaning. And this is something that I think, uh, as the Chinese think about their past, they are um, collecting um, without necessarily putting a narrative over it. Thank Wonderful, you thank you. Well, what varied richness we have to discuss here with the sacred and profane. So, questions. Uh, Olaya. Uh, Colleen, you talk about the unique use of the past that the Mormons made, but I wonder which is the difference between this use and the idea of commemorate, commemoration which is essential to Catholic religion in the sense that the past is uh, recreated every time of the community. Yeah, I think one of the important things about the way that Mormons deal with the past is that it's always in story. It's always in narrative. So there has to be a long story. There has to be a narrative that goes along along with it. So it's in the process of telling the story. And how do you tell the story? And in this case, you tell the story with material <coughs> culture and objects. So it's not, it's not ritual. It is ritualized, but in a, in a narrative form. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, um, thank you very much for these papers, uh, Colleen and Denise. I'm very interested in this problem of how historians write the history of the recent past. And so I was also interested in this question of methodology. Uh, and uh, Denise, you talked a little bit about oral history, and I was wondering for you, Colleen, going to these sites, and clearly you're going and you're observing, are you talking to people? And, and how, I mean, how do we, um, I really, I have questions about having historical empathy, right? How do, you, how do you deal with these people respectfully? Right, well, I mean, I've done a lot of this work in the past, so it's, it's relatively familiar to me. Um, and, you know, the, everyone comes at these sites in, with very different ways and very different stories. So I've interviewed the sister missionaries, I've talked, with pe I've talked to people who come to the sites. I just hang out, basically, and try to get a sense of what's going on. And so everyone comes, I mean, in the longer version of the paper, for instance, we'll go through this whole process, and at the end I heard people say, wow, I never knew this about the Civil War. <laughs> and so, it, you know, I mean, no matter, it, it's just a diff different way. I mean, everyone kind of comes at it as a, as a different way. Is, am I getting at, you're talking about my empathy for the individuals yeah, or also their, that, also that their sort of sense? Yeah, yeah, I mean, how are, you, how are you as a researcher and historian, you're dealing with people in the present? Right. The recent past, right. Right. But I, I think that's part of what's happening. I think why I be, began, I became interested in how Mormons dealt with history because so much energy is put to to produce history in a variety of ways. This is one way which is geared towards families and children, but they also produce very, very technical documentary um, materials that, that 
that compete with the Thomas Jefferson papers and the Lincoln papers and all these other ex exceedingly technical work. And so there's a whole variety of different ways. And I, I just think that's part of what the scholar has to do is kind of be flexible enough to deal with different constituencies as they work through history. Dan, then Steve. There's, there's something delightfully subversive about both your papers because <laughs> what, what you both do brilliantly is, is to talk in different ways about the embodiment of experience. And so in mm -hmm. your case, Colleen, is the embodiment of Mormon history. And Denise, you mentioned how revolution had to be embodied and people have actually experienced it. So material culture, or in what you do to it, whether you uh, replicate it or destroy it, becomes the vehicle for this embodied experience. The reason it's subversive is that the title of the category you're in is symbolism. And we tend to think of symbolism as being an action of the mind. And what you're actually saying is that symbolism is an action of the is in the body. Would I you like to comment on on Dan's observation? Um, I think I would add the other like, the category that's also relevant is, is the question of performance as well. Yeah. Um, yes. Does at what point does the uh, does the performing then does the material plus the performing then add up to to, to belief or or understanding of um, of one's role or one's class or one's character? Um, and one of the refrains I would hear in, in my oral histories over and over again was, you know, we were very innocent then. You know, we're not as uh, you know we're not as sophisticated as people are now. We didn't we didn't question. Um, we, we wouldn't have thought of this, this in, a, in, a, in a different way. Um, obviously, that's one, one category of person. Um, the other category of person um, is the sort of person whose family did come from uh, a landlord's family or from a capitalist or intellectual's family who would be sitting in these political meetings and sweating bullets because they didn't really know how to look or how to feel or how you know, somebody might look at them, smile, or, uh, or misinterpret a laugh and think that uh, uh, that they actually were having counter-revolutionary thoughts. So I think in Mao's China, um, uh, your thought um, could be imputed by other people. Um, so I, I don't know if you can really separate all of those categories. Stephen and Peter. I, one of the things that occurs to me that, that happening in both of these papers um, is, is, the, is the problem of chronology, and continuity, and rupture. Um, because Colleen, when you said that uh, you, you wanted to suggest that for the LDS folks participating in all of this, and, and maybe for religious people more broadly, uh, chronology does fall up. It doesn't, it's not linear. The past and the present are, are blurred in all kinds of ways. Yes, but the, the purpose of all of those historic sites for the Mormon church is to demonstrate a historical rootedness in the American tradition. They want to be a part of that chronology. They want to demonstrate their essential Americanness, even as they are offering really an entirely different kind of cosmological narrative, uh, which is born in the United States. And of course, in Mao's China, um, you know, it's, it's sort of like the, 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 the revolutionary moment in France when we start with year zero. We're going to destroy everything, but we're going to keep a whole lot of lists of it in case we want to bring it all back, <laughs> or some of it back, or we're not exactly sure exactly what. So even at that kind of moment that, that where, where, you, where you really have mobilized the pop population to, to rupture the historical continuity, but not quite prepared to do it all the way, it just seems to me that both of those papers raise that question kind of interestingly. Um, let, me, let me just address the Americanness issue. There was an earlier monument, which goes back to the kind of commemoration monument, um, done in, it was built in the, in the late 1920s uh, for the Mormon Battalion. And at that point, Americanness was what was on people's minds. I mean, Mormons were coming right, at, right off of having been vilified for, centu for a century they were coming right off of the polygamy controversies, and they wanted to join the nation. And so it was very, was very much a patriotic statement. 
this is not a patriotic statement. This is not a statement of Americanness. This is a statement of global Mormonism because that's where, that is what is the big problem and the issue. Mormons are Americans, right? I mean, they're wrong. How much more American can you get? Okay, even though maybe it's people were born in Mexico. All right, whatever. <laughs> but the key, is, the key is, for Mormons, the problem is a global problem. How do you move? So Mormons have moved from being a local, regional religion in Utah to being a national U.S. religion, and now their issue, now they are a global religion with 14 million members. And so they are presenting in the Mormon Battalion not a kind of narrow patriotism, being a part of the national story, but being a part of the global and globalization story, which is wh where their issues are. Uh, Peter, and then Chris. Just very briefly, uh, mostly for Colleen, also true for Eli, perhaps. Um, the, the listening to the account and the description of the heritage religion um, I, I kept thinking about period rooms in museums, yeah. which operate with the same epistemology. And that led, lead, led me to think that there was a word, I think, lurking around, perhaps a practice associated, which hasn't come out uh, thus far. And that's imagination, the relationship between the material and the imaginative. And I'm wondering where you think that might lie in this story. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, because some people have told me that all of these objects and things cramp down the imagination, and that the imagination is fundamentally immaterial. And so a certain class of people, a certain type of people, you know, the academic person, will tell me, oh, that's, that's all horrible because that, that ruins the imagination by rooting it to the material. Whereas <coughs> average people, I don't know what a better term to say, use the material to stimulate the imagination, and people will talk about that. But that imagination is channeled very carefully in certain ways. And so, and the channeling that goes on in the Mormon Battalion is the whole, because you're trying to create this global phenomena out of fundamentally a capitalist and colonialist adventure, you have to then channel that imagination away from colonialism, because that doesn't work in 21st century America. And so you have to use your imagination, you have to use material culture, the institution uses material culture to channel, just like to, to channel in those period rooms. I mean, I think. Do you see that as exceptional, though? Oh, no, I don't in think it's exceptional. In the history of historic preservation, it seems actually quite in congruent with. Yeah, no, I, I don't think it's exceptional. The House at all. of the Seven yeah. Gables or anything else. Right. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, in taking, um, well, the two papers are great, by the way. In taking Colleen's uh, theme of creating a future from the past, I just wanted if I could transfer that theme now to Denise and ask you how is the, the pre cultural revolution heritage of China being used now in the post cultural revolution world? Is, is the past, again, you know, a source of legitimacy in the present, or how is it being sort of represented now? Uh, so the question is, is it the, is it the cultural revolution past or is it the pre-1949? No, um, yeah, but the, I'm talking about the pre-1949 past. How is, how is that past, the pre-communist past, being used now in the post-cultural revolution period? Um, I think there are different ways to, to answer that question. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the classic studies of this is how, uh, how are the, uh, the nationalists, how are the going down? the party that the communists thought, how were they thought of? Um, because of course, first, um, th there was less discussion of World War II because then you would have to talk about, you would have to talk about the role of the nationalists. Um, and now that has come back, there has been some rehabilitation. Um, and you can see that in, um, you can see that in the museums that commemorate what the Chinese call the War of Resistance Against Japan, which we would think of as, as the Second World War. Well, I so think that's more changed. In terms of the use of imperial China, the heritage from imperial China yeah. in the post-cultural revolution. In, in imperial China's times, times um, I think it's used to, to think about China as a unified empire. Um, so if you want to think about mm -hmm. assimilating minorities, or if you want to think about this, the borders of China, or if you want to think about um, glories, uh, for example, you would remember um, a glorious and cosmopolitan um, dynasties rather than corrupt and decadent ones, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, but it's still, it's still quite contested. If I could bring up um, the, one of the previous slides. Um, to just to give you a case study, uh, maybe to look at. 
So this, the landlord's bed, um, this was actually a, a, a recreated bed that was made during the Great Leap Forward. Um, so this was put up in a museum. There was a, a landlord um, who became the archetypical evil landlord, despicable landlord. Um, I rented from him, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he died in 1949, conveniently a few months before the communists came to power. And um, he, uh, his house became a museum. Um, which was first called different things, the Landlord Museum, the Class Education uh, Exhibition Hall, and at the height of the, of the uh, in the post uh, Great Leap Forward, when 30 million of Chinese, Chinese people starved to death, um, the museum staff uh, made this bed to demonstrate his decadence. Um, and it's such a big, ornately covered bed um, uh, that it fills the entire room. Um, so it's kind of, it doesn't really quite make sense. Um, and that bed is still on display. And it's still described as the bed of the landlord. Um, but um, in some work I've done more recently, I filmed his grandson going through the courtyards of his grandfather's home. So to him, it's not, it's not the landlord museum. It's my grandpa's house. Um, and he will go through the rooms and say, this is how it used to be. And this is how, um, this is how people described it. And then he actually gets quite angry outside of the, uh, outside of the dragon bed room. Um, and we filmed him. With a con uh, having a confrontation with tourists and the official docent, um, where he jumps into the narration and he says, "This is not. This was my room. Um, this was made up. And how much did this cost?" Um, because, of, because of course, because of course, what's being told in the Mao era is this cost how much grain. Um, and so he then turns it around and says, how much grain and what was happening then? And what was Mao eating at that time? What do you think Mao was eating at that time? <laughs> and so, so the, the bed is still on display, but it's, there's, no, there's no explanation behind it. Um, and so it's, uh, it's still extremely fraught. So it's a new narrative being sort of emerging um, almost organically. Um, because, because the people, the, land, the um, cadres who participated in land reform are still alive. So there's a contingent of about five old men who don't want this museum to change. Um, right, Steve, Steve has yeah, a just a final point. point. Yeah. Um, is the sort of strange Confucian revival that's sort of going on, and the Confucian institutes, the Confucians that are popping up, is that at all an answer to this question as well about trying to resurrect a, a much earlier Chinese history and, and bring it back Sort of suitable for the for the uh, hyper capitalist age. Um, well, there was never quite um, people didn't quite ever let go of Confucius. Um, so okay. there's a, a historian at the University of Heidelberg who argues that actually more people during the Mao period knew about Confucius than ever before because there was the anti-Confucius campaign. Um, <laughs> so all of these people actually knew who Confucius was because uh, they all had they all had to study in order to criticize. Um, and then the other the other aspect of that is um, in the Confucius's hometown in Chufu, um, a historian in Rochester has written about this. Um, there were actually pitched battles between Red Guards and local people who, who saw it you know, legitimately as their, their cultural heritage and defended the Confucius temple with their lives. Um, so it would, never went away. Last question for Sushi. Uh, yeah, just building on the, the last two comments, it's a really wonderful, wonderful paper. Um, I guess the question it raised for me is where to go next comparatively with the story you tell. And so sort of picking up on the comments that have just been made, is this a particularly kind of Chinese story? Because we've had these waves of um, historical change, Qing, nationalist, republican, etc., uh, etc. Et um, or can we sort of broaden it out to think of, I don't know, um, uh, post-partition India or something like this? Um, do we see um, similar sort of strategies, really, um, with other types of authoritarian states, perhaps, um, in this part of the world, um, or not? It's a very big question, but that's the one that kind of arises. So one can either go down the specificity sort of line and say it's about the 20th century history of China more broadly, um, right across the 20th century. It certainly um, is a longer story of, um, it's, it's, a, it's not just a Mao era story, it's a longer story. Um, the May 4th movement in 1919 sure. was the original, well not the original, it, it was one, it was, it was an Akhan classic movement in its yeah. own way, um, but on the other hand, um, people who argue for um, art, uh, artistic preservation in the Cultural Revolution draw on um, draw on earlier periods, draw on Sun Yat-sen, draw on Mao, mm -hmm. um, why we should preserve the Chinese past. 
Um, so, so it is certainly a, a longer, it's, it's a longer story. I don't know that it's only a Chinese story. I've gotten this question before and I never know exactly how to answer it. Um, because you have iconoclasm, you have this question of, 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 of identity. Um, I do think that one thing that is not, maybe not unique, but at least uh, particular in, in the Chinese case is um, you have another, another place that also c claims to be China. Right. Sure. So, um, so you have yeah. two palace yeah. museums, for example, and of course there are. That's not the only example of, of two places with a, with the same cultural heritage, um, but you you, you just do have a um, a contestation of different places that are culturally Chinese who claim to be China. Just mm -hmm. if I could just add something that just that I resonated with about this the the shaming rituals with the you know point of pulling out all the the capitalist, you know, um, wealthy uh, material culture and putting on display and stuff. It reminded me of the, I just saw yesterday at the Noy Gallery, the um, exhibition on um, German expressionism and degenerate art. Mm -hmm. And the National Socialists um, had, had this traveling exhibition in 1933 where they put on display all the German art of a certain type that they didn't like, and so they collected it all, and then it traveled around, and you know, then it was mm. restored, and some of it was destroyed, and some of it w survived, and now, you know, of course, Germany celebrates this art, and it reminds me very much of this, like coming around again, of you know, one group showcasing something they thought was anus, and then bringing it back out. Last word to comment. Yeah, one quick comment. Also, um, the Nazis took relig Jewish religious objects in Prague and yes. created the Jewish Museum, which in some ways also parallels the same thing because then they and they cataloged it and they had the whole kind of sense of that. Can I just? I mean, there are really modern precedents. Yes. After the French Revolution, after the Revolution yes. as well. I mean, yes. Without all the way in which objects have been created. Yeah. 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 The way in which they get institutionalized. So yes. there's a much history of the way in which they go Yes. Yes. Good. Well, thank you very much, Colleen and Denise. This is great.